Welcome to Novara Live. I am Michael Walker on this very sunny Friday evening. I'm joined by Aaron Bastani. Aaron, um, are you enjoying the, the first days of summer? I am. It's nice and warm. Uh, yeah, can't wait to get involved in, uh, in today's stories. Nice and warm. Come on, you, you've got to have something better than that on the, on the other stories we're doing tonight. It is nice and warm. I was put him on the spot there, I suppose. Um, coming up later tonight, Keir Starmer has laid out new plans for migration. Um, he says he'll deploy MI5 to target people smugglers. Um, will that work? Do we want it to work? Um, we'll be discussing that. Um, the founder of Bumble has claimed that AI is about to revolutionize dating apps. Uh, the internet is nearly universally up in arms at this. Um, I have a contrarian opinion, which is, I think it's maybe a good idea. And um, we'll also discuss Hillary Clinton, who has weighed in on the US campus protests. On that one, I am very much in line with the majority opinion um, on X or Twitter. Keir Starmer gave a speech in Labour's newest constituency. It's Natalie Elphick's seat in Dover. Of course, they didn't win the seat. They just got it by default because she crossed the floor. Um, Elphick introduced Keir Starmer at the press conference um, he gave today. And he announced this. A new manifesto commitment. We will set up a new command with new powers, new resources, and a new way of doing things. Border Security Command. Now, this is about leveraging the power and potential of dynamic government based on a counter-terrorism approach, which we know works. An end to the fragmentation between policing, the border force, and our intelligence agencies. A collecting of the standards. So the border protection becomes an elite force, not a Cinderella service, an essential frontline defence that communities like this can depend on. To do all that, Border Security Command will bring together hundreds of specialist investigators, the best of the best, from the National Crime Agency, the Border Force, Immigration Enforcement, the Crown Prosecution Service, and yes, MI5. MI5 are on the case. The world's best intelligence. James Bond, uh, these the spies are going to be out there, um, really sorting it out um, alongside, I suppose he was MI6, wasn't he? Is that the international one? I'll ask Aaron in a moment. It is the international one. Uh, my producer, Alex, is, is nodding at me. Uh, I haven't watched James Bond in a while. Um, alongside getting MI5 involved, um, Keir Starmer said he would also create new anti-terrorism powers for the border force to use against people smugglers. Now, I have to say, this all seems a little bit silly to me. I can see why Keir Starmer is announcing it. It's politically costless. You know, he doesn't have to, uh, he's not having to give up anything. He just said, oh, you know how we're going to sort out the, the problem with these small boats? We're going to hire more competent people. And um, we're going to get MI5 involved. We're going to have a really competent border force. force. Competent border force. Right. Now, you know, the Tories are somewhat incompetent. But there isn't, they are trying to stop the, the smugglers, right? The, the problem is it's very difficult to do that because you've got a very long shore. You've got lots of people that want to come to the UK. And this idea that if we just get smart enough people to try and stop these boats, that's going to make any difference to me just seems completely bizarre. Remember, it, it's not the case that they've just got to find a boat when it's already crossing the channel. They have to find it while it's still in France and stop it launching. Right, so one, you're going to need a lot of collaboration with the French. Well, it's not necessarily guaranteed. And two, there's you know hundreds of kilometers of of coast. So this this seems to me to be a bit of a technocratic fantasy. We've heard a few of those um, from Keir Starmer. It's also a step backwards from Labour did actually announce a sensible policy on this. Um, I think it was like a year ago, and then they they stepped back from it. So they said the way to stop the boats is you need a returns deal with France. Um, that would mean sort of buying into the responsibility sharing. Um, deal that sort of the EU is negotiating, whereby um, asylum seekers on the continent will be dispersed to different countries, you know, ideally the countries that they prefer to go to. Um, and in exchange for that, we would have an agreement with France, whereby anyone who crosses the channel gets immediately sent back to France. If we had done that, that would stop the boats within a day, right? But that was seen as politically toxic because it would mean that the UK buying into some sort of scheme where we would be accepting um, asylum seekers from the continent. So that deal that would have worked is now gone, and we're in this sort of politically easy but practically 
meaningless policy, I think, of saying, well, we're going to have exactly the same policies, but it's going to be more effective. And we're also going to have some anti-terror law on the side. So I'm not convinced, but that was um, Starmer talking tough on the border. Um, and he did also make comments about how the asylum system would work for people who do still make it to Britain. I believe in a rules-based asylum system. I believe that a system that processes claims quickly and humanely, and that finds ways without squeamishness or cruelty to detain and remove people who have no right to be here is essential for security, fairness and justice. It is a form of deterrence in itself because until we're seen around the world as a country that has a firm grip of the process at our border, until we're busting the home office backlog, arriving at decisions quickly without a fuss so we can return people who have no right to be here, then yes, Britain will be seen as a soft touch. So later in the speech, Starmer said that to get the asylum backlog down and save money on hotels, he'll recruit a new processing and removals unit. So sort of another technocratic solution. Um, and as you heard in that speech, he thinks that that will serve as a deterrent to stop people crossing the channel, you know, because we'll be processing their claims. And if they don't have a right to be here, they'll be deported straight away. That means um, uh, that's, that's a deterrent. What's the point in turning up if we're going to get sent away anyway? The problem with this, you know, if, if what you want is the ends that Keir Starmer's explaining, obviously, you know, many of you might think, you know, you don't want a deterrent. You know, we should be more welcoming. But if you're claiming, as Keir Starmer is, that this would serve as a deterrent, I don't think that works. It's not obvious to me that that would work. Because last year, the acceptance rate for asylum seekers who received a decision, obviously, there are lots of people just languishing, waiting for a decision. But of those who received a decision, 63% were accepted as asylum seekers or accepted as refugees or some other humanitarian status. So unless Starmer has some argument as to why that figure would dramatically fall, speeding up the process of granting asylum would presumably just make Britain more attractive, not less attractive, right, for people seeking asylum. Come to Britain and very quickly you'll have your case heard and there's a two-thirds chance you'll be accepted. Again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but the idea that would serve as a deterrent seems a little bit confusing to me. And it is that idea that Labour's policy lacks a deterrent, which has become the main criticism of Starmer's announcement. This was a question from a Daily Mail journalist at Starmer's press conference. You said you want to replace the Rwanda policy permanently. What are you going to replace it with? Do you actually have a plan to deter migrants or are you just replicating the uh, small boats command to which the government has already introduced? I think processing, firstly, I think stopping the gangs get people in boats is the most effective deterrent because you can't actually make the crossing to get here. At the moment, the government is not, not securing the borders and stopping people arriving in the first place. It's saying, assuming you've got here because we've lost control of the borders, assuming you've sat here for a considerable period of time, we might send some of you to Rwanda. And they say that's going to be a deterrent. Well, since Rishi Sunak, he did a victory um, uh, press conference. Some of you will undoubtedly have been there. This was uh, two and a half weeks ago. Since then, thousands of people have come. Since the act got royal assent, so people are vulnerable to go under the Rwanda scheme, thousands of people have come. So the evidence that this is a deterrent, compared with smashing the gangs in the first place, is simply not there. I think processing the claims and swiftly sending people back to countries of origin when they've no right to be here is a deterrent because you made all that journey, you've got here, and then you sent back straight back to where you started because you've got no right to be here. That isn't happening. The biggest deterrent is that it's a pointless exercise and you go back where you started. Now, of course, it's not going to be a pointless exercise if two thirds of people get accepted. Now, again, I'm not saying Starmer should come out with some policy whereby he says, will dramatically reduce the number of people whose claims are accepted. The reason people's claims are accepted is generally because they're genuinely fleeing a very dangerous country, right? So they're accepted for very good reasons. But the idea that you speed up that process and that serves as a deterrent, I mean, Aaron, it seems so confused to me that, you know, I can see the electoral positioning, but it, it, it's not going to work in the way that he's sort of suggesting it will. And I wonder what their plan is, you know, if, as we expect, they do get into government. Well, isn't it funny, Michael? You've got Diane Abbott waiting more than a year to be given back the whip to join 
rejoined the Parliamentary Labour Party, Annalise Dodds on television saying, we have an independent process, these things take time, uh, and we're supposed to believe the precise same Labour Party, which takes more than 12 months to determine whether an MP can return to the fold, they're somehow going to process asylum applications in six months. Uh, it just seems quite stupid, really. Can you imagine as well, Michael, here's one for you. Can you imagine the response from the liberal media if Boris Johnson said, I want to involve MI5 in border policing in this country? Can you imagine security services in um, enforcing uh, the UK's borders? We would have James O'Brien giving all day call-ins. We would have panoramas. We would have news nights. We would have a, a plethora of Guardian and Observer front pages. We'd have Paul Mason tweets saying, this is fascism 2.0, the 1930s are back. Because it's Keir Starmer, not only will they not do that, they'll now say it's a very sensible grown-up policy. This is what we wanted all along. Uh, so look, it's a bit of a non-policy. And that final point he made there about um, expediting the process itself being a deterrent is clearly nonsense. Even if people think they've got a 10, 20, 30% chance of getting um, uh, rights to asylum in the UK, they'll still take that chance. People are on record as saying that. You know, I, I thought if there's a 1% chance, I'll try my luck. So uh, this idea that a, a quick process, an efficient process, an effective process in itself is a deterrent strikes me as quite strange. You'd imagine most people presume that's happening anyway. Um, so yeah, look, I, I agree, non-policy, but I'd also add it has that typical New Labour flourish of having kind of like Hollywood 1990s style infatuation with um, policing. Yes, and of course, we're talking about border, border operations, of course, there's a policing aspect to it, but with a kind of a hint of, you know, showbiz. MI5, the best of the best, you know, like it's uh, like Cops, the 90s TV series. I still think that sort of thinking, um, that kind of tone inflects uh, New Labour to a significant degree. It did, of course, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. But I think the way he's talking about that policy in such a similar manner really conveys how his faction, I think he is a member of the Labour right, the Labour right generally, have really failed to, to move on from the political aesthetics of 20 years ago. The speech was longer, but there were so many rhetorical flourishes of these vile, inhuman, smuggling gangs. You know, it's, the, the thing that's always avoided here is that, you know, I'm sure the smugglers aren't particularly ethical, moral people. This is organized crime, really. But they are responding to a demand of real, genuine people. You know, they, these are, sometimes they're sort of referred to as people traffickers. And not people traffickers. Trafficking is when you move someone across borders against their will. So sort of sex trafficking is when you sort of, you've, uh, I don't know exactly how it works, but I imagine sort of you, you lure someone under false pretenses and then you, you push them across the border and then you sell them into sort of sex work or whatever um, against their will. That's trafficking. Smuggling or people smuggling is when someone really wants to cross the border and you help them do it. So it's, it, it's not this sort of painting these migrants as these sort of these victims who are being exploited by these people smugglers. That, that people want to cross the channel and they need someone to provide that service and the smugglers are providing it. Doesn't mean they're good people. Obviously, it doesn't mean they're good people. But the way this is discussed is just completely divorced from the reality. Um, uh, let's look at a bit more of, of the reality from an expert. Um, the World at One. Um, had one on today to discuss whether Starmer's measures to crack down on gangs would make a difference. Peter Walsh is senior research at the Oxford Migration Observatory. I do have some scepticism, and that's just because the, the powers are already quite wide, they're quite penetrating. Um, the legislative framework is tough. Smugglers can face life imprisonment in the UK, but it also is because of the nature of the problem that's being Police, you know, these smuggling networks are international. Yeah. Um, they operate in countries as far flung as Afghanistan, Iraq, Turkey. It's, it, these are areas outside of our and France's jurisdictional control. Uh, there's 300 kilometers of viable coastline. That's very difficult to police. And then, of course, it's just the nature of the smuggling operatives on the ground. They work in small groups, and you, you squash one group, maybe a handful of individuals and another emerges in its place. So it's just a very, very difficult task operationally. I thought that was a very, you know, clarifying intervention. You know, you've got 300 kilometers of coast. 
Um, it, it's not the case that if you get the big top uh, you know, people smuggler, you know, if you go to the top of the pyramid and you take them out, then there's no one who can help people cross the channel. It's actually a very low tech business, isn't it? All you're doing, is, all you need is a speedboat. And then you, you need to get your, your, your sort of number out there, presumably. People need to have a way to, to, to find you, find who you are. Um, and then they pay you some money and you take them across the channel on a boat. Right. It's, it, it's not sort of like once you take off the head hunt show, this is going to all sort of crumble. If you've got a, a business model, which is actually, you know, the, the barriers of entry are very low, then there is no way, unless you've got sort of people patrolling all 300 kilometers of the French coast, which seems, I suppose it goes up to Belgium as well, the, the, the continental coast, um, it seems that this is all just going to be a bit meaningless. Um, Aaron, what do you think about this? And I suppose, do you have an idea of what a more meaningful thing for Labour to announce might be? Well, I think you hinted at it um, a few moments ago, that the policy a year ago is a sensible one. I think we clearly need a coordinated cross-European um, position policy on migration, especially over the coming decades, what with displaced peoples as a result of climate change, et cetera. That's only going to become more of an issue. So I would say you need some kind of quota system shared amongst European countries, done in a fair way. Where you say that people are given the option to go where they like, I don't quite know how that's going to work because, of course... There's lots of empty land in places like Bulgaria, Romania, um, and then you have very densely populated parts of Europe, the Netherlands, the UK, where people are more likely to want to go. So I think you, you know, you'd also have to factor in where, where there is available land. I mean, when people say, where's the lap? Um, yes, the southeast of England is quite, you know, quite a hectic place, but Scotland is very underpopulated. Much of Scandinavia is very underpopulated. Like I say, you've had depopulation in places like Bulgaria over the last 25 years. So I, I think you want um, a fair um, a cross continental coordinated system. But I think alongside that, and it's something I've said before, and honestly, nobody talks about it, Michael, and I really don't understand why, is that we should have um, a safe, legal way of people being able to enter the country, but being able to do so from elsewhere. So for instance, we could have rapprochement with Iran, the UK, that is. Uh, and we could say, look, if you're Afghan um, and you want to apply for asylum in the UK, many reasons why you might want to do that. You may have been a British translator, an army translator. You may be um, um, an activist of some kind. You may be from a certain minority, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can go to these multiple locations in Iran. Your application will be processed. If it's, if it's uh, positive, then you know, we'll, we'll expedite your, your travel to the UK. Millions of Afghans already go to Iran. Right, because they share a language, very easy to assimilate. You have millions and millions of refugees in, in Iran already. That seems to me quite obvious. You could do something like that. You could do something quite similar for Iraqis, Syrians in nearby countries. And, you know, like you say, given we're already accepting 65% of the people that arrive, uh, you could have probably something lower because you're, you're reducing the entry costs for people to make the application. But it would also be fairer because right now, of course, there's basically a test which says if you're able-bodied, young, um, and you can travel thousands of kilometers on very little sleep, horrific process, then you can come to the UK and you can get your shot. That's also not fair and fair on many of the people who perhaps do need to flee somewhere like Iraq, uh, less likely than Afghanistan, frankly, but uh, we, can, we can say there too, or, or Syria. I think Afghanistan for me is the really outstanding example. And we owe the people of Afghanistan so much because we screwed their country up for 20 years. I think actually many people in that country merit asylum. But like I say, that could be done in partnership with Iran. But of course, what that means is working with Iran, right? That would say, uh, what? Washington certainly won't have that. So it's a sensible policy for the UK. But because, of course, we take the lead from the United States, and effectively UK foreign policy is written by Washington. Uh, we've outsourced it since 1941. Uh, that that can't happen. I think that's a sensible sensible policy. Um, alongside, of course, enhancing foreign commonwealth operations. So it's not called that anymore, of course. Um, uh, operations and various diplomatic presences in the in the key countries affected. And then finally, I say this all the time, Michael, but it's just so absent in mainstream media conversations. I have to keep on saying it. It is no coincidence that the peoples coming to Europe are Afghans, Syrians. Iraqis, Libyans, um, and by the way, Iranians too. 
if there was a war between Israel and Iran, we'd have more Iranians. And it doesn't seem to figure for many people on the, on the right of politics that, well, if there's a war between Israel and Iran and there is regime change in Tehran, which we all seem to want, okay, well, if it becomes Syria, what does that mean? It means, let's say, 10 million plus people displaced, wherever most of them go, Europe. Um, it, it doesn't, they don't seem to join the dots. Failed foreign policy equals displaced peoples equals refugees coming to Europe. But I don't like refugees. Okay, well, fine. So why are you such a fan of the foreign policy um, decisions which have caused that? They, they, they can't understand, for whatever reason, the relationship between cause and effect. I, I think if we want a serious conversation about reducing the number of displaced people in Europe's near abroad, we have to also have a, a sensible conversation about changes to foreign policy and also changes in the economic relationship that we as wealthier countries have with poorer ones. You can't have a global economic model based upon underdevelopment in parts of West Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, South Asia, and at the same time say, well, why are people leaving those countries? It's in Europe's interest for countries across North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, to be um, wealthy, prosperous, growing quickly with effective infrastructure. That's not the world order we're building in the 21st century for a bunch of reasons, probably too long to expand upon in, in one show. But the point is, if you care about um, if you care about this issue for whatever reason, if you think we should be giving more people asylum, or if you think we're soft touch, as, as Keir Starmer said, regardless, this whole issue is a direct outgrowth of, like I say, foreign policy choices and quote unquote development policy in the 21st century. And I think only the left really is capable of offering that holistic vision you know, the right seems to think that, look, hundreds of millions of people want to move from A to B just because we're better and those places are awful. Well, the fact is that most people stay in their countries uh, and most people who do leave their countries go to countries literally next door to theirs. So that, that simply isn't true uh, as an argument. I think there are many sensible policy choices we can make. But sadly, the sort of media environment within which this conversation is conducted is so toxic. It's very, very hard to do that. So I suppose uh, I, I disagree with a number of things out there. So, so, so in terms of density, I, I don't think it matters that much how many people live in each square mile. Like, I think the idea that you, you know you send people to desolate, I'm not saying you're suggesting sending people to desolate Scandinavia, but I think if you're having some sort of responsibility sharing system, it's more based on where, where are the houses built, where are the public services, not sort of where is there literally land. Because obviously we have shed loads of empty space in Britain. I don't think we are sort of too densely populated in terms of people compared to land. It's more about pressures on housing and the like. I suppose I wasn't saying sort of people should just get sent wherever they want to go, because I'm just saying you'd have a preference system, right? So ideally, best case scenario, everyone would get to go where they want to go. But obviously, if you're having a responsibility sharing program, then some people have to go to their second or third choice. In terms of the safe route, so I'm, I think this is a good idea for humanitarian reasons. The reason I think that Labour aren't putting it front and centre is because there is, it's, it won't stop the boats. Because if you're going to have sort of people apply for asylum in country in say Iran or Afghanistan for example the people who you're most likely to accept are probably not going to be the same people who would come here via sort of those unconventional or irregular routes as you say so that's going to be younger able-bodied people the people that you're going to give to asylum sort of in country is probably more likely to, to skew more female than the people who come over land and more vulnerable than the people who come over land so I think you would still have nearly as many people who are saying, well, I'm probably not going to get through via the safe route, so I'm still going to go over land. That's not to say don't do it, but it's to say it still won't solve the boat's problem if you see it as a problem. And then on the, something that's, that's sort of really changed my opinion on migration and where it's going is I've read a couple of books that sort of have really made clear how important smartphones are. So there are loads more people who are trying to get to the rich world um, at the moment for very good reason. Right. And it's not because the global south has got poorer. Like the global south is, you know, it's, it, 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 we should have trade relations which make it easier to get rich than, than they currently are. But the global south is getting richer. But because of smartphones, our sort of our world is getting smaller. So you've got lots of people who are in a low income country. They can see on their phone, oh, this is how people live in Europe. And also your phone gives you a, a much easier route to get there because you can sort of try and get to Europe while you're still in your family group chat, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think there is a sort of happy, easy left-wing answer here. I think there it's are not... always going to be. So, so, so long as sort of Britain is richer than Africa, right? There's always going to be a lot of people trying to move. And you either then got to have a very difficult conversation, which is 
you know, we should let everyone in, or you're going to have to have some difficult border policy. This is it's something I rack my brains of a lot because I don't think there are any comfortable sort of policies here. Well, I, I mean, I really disagree with that, Michael, because we know that the leading countries, which are sources of people who are engaged in um, undocumented migration, the people getting on these quote unquote small boats, are actually from places like Iran, Afghanistan, Syria. So I, I don't buy that, actually. I, I don't buy that. You know, you could postulate in 20, 30 years time, yes, of course, that's the direction of travel. I think there's a very strong argument. I, mean, I agree with you entirely on the phone's point. Um, but Iran, uh, no, people aren't getting rich there, actually. You know, it's very hard to get hold of basic medications there because of some of the most stringent sanctions on earth. So again, just as that, as one example, I find it utterly ridiculous, stupid, that one might say, well, uh, why are they leaving Iran? It's a perfectly affluent country. Well, we've got sanctions on that country, literally designed hmm. to cripple the economy and drive regime change. Um, in the case of Iraq, yeah, Iraq's doing better. Uh, it's still it's still poor, right? It's still very poor in comparative terms compared to where it was really even in the, in the early 90s. Well, early 1990s, there were sanctions then. You know, you, you'd say almost early 1980s. Like the, the standard of living is very, very tough in these places. Um, in terms of sub-Saharan Africa, slightly different argument to West Asia. And by the way, as I've said, most of the people coming on the small boats are coming from West Asia, from Afghanistan all the way through to, to Syria. Africa is a different one because, of course, you have, I think that the population of Africa really is going to double between now and 2050, a huge surplus of people. And I use that word very specifically because it's exactly the process that Europe had in the 19th century. We had lots of surplus labor, lots of healthy, fit young men who couldn't find necessarily enough work, they wanted to find opportunities elsewhere. Well, what happened? We, we, we sent that surplus population to, quote unquote, the new world. Argentina, Australia, the United States, the whole of Europe did that. That was a safety valve for revol a revolution in this continent. You know, uh, European history looks very different if those people can't leave and go to other parts of the world. So that, I agree with you. That's a very different conversation. It's very germane for the politics of both Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. But in the here and now, the people getting on the small boats, I think there's just a profound hypocrisy um, if you say, well, why are they coming here? Well, we have sanctions on Syria. We have sanctions on Iran. We are refusing to work with the Taliban, and we helped absolutely obliterate Iraq. I mean, that's four countries there, Michael. There's a direct relationship there between foreign policy and, and the kinds of people who are coming here right now. So, I, I mean, I do disagree. I, I do profoundly disagree. I know so many Iranians who, who, who would go back to Iran, who would live in Iran if there weren't sanctions in that country. You know, I'm, I'm British. I'm very happy to live here. I won't even travel to Iran because of the sanctions, because of, of, of the nature of the political antagonism between the two countries. I won't even travel there. Right? And, and so many Iranians are looking to get out because it's so hard there. You can't, like I say, even access basic medicines. So I, I'm not so sure. That doesn't mean there's an easy, easy left-wing answer. I agree with you there, Michael. But actually, if you break down the numbers of people getting on the small boats, where they're coming from, there's a very clear relationship between mistaken foreign policy, um, our, 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 our desire fundamentally to underdevelop, particularly the economies of West Asia, and the people coming here. I think there's a big difference depending on if you're thinking about this as, as a British issue or a European issue. Because I think when it comes to Britain, for historical reasons, it is people coming from the Middle East who are tending to cross on small boats. But if you're looking at continental Europe, it is much more the people arriving in Italy, for example, are coming from Africa. And then I think you, you know, I'm, I, I, I would want to cross the Mediterranean if I knew that I could, you know, live a much better life if I crossed that sea. Um, but I, I, this is just to say, I don't think there are any sort of easy, easy answers to this one. So I think about it an awful lot. Um, let's go back to sort of the mundane politics of this for one moment and take a moment to focus on Natalie Elphick, Labour's newest MP. Um, as I said earlier, she introduced Keir Starmer in Dover today, where she said this. It's clear that Rishi Sunak has failed to keep our borders secure and cannot be trusted. A fresh approach is needed. An approach that puts at its heart a commitment to border security, which tackles the criminal gangs behind the small boats crisis and saves lives. Now, the idea that Natalie Elphick puts a priority on saving lives is questionable, especially after these comments by her former colleague on the Tory benches, Michael Fabrican. That was at a Christmas do with her. And she was telling me that she thinks the Royal Navy, if necessary, should open fire on the French Navy if they don't accept our pushing boats back into French territorial waters. 
And I was saying to her, well, hang on, these boats are pretty unstable. If you nudge them, people will get drowned. And uh, her response... Are you suggesting that, Sir Michael? I beg your pardon? Are you suggesting the boat should be nudged? No, of course not. Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm saying that she was suggesting it, and I find it utterly amazing that somebody with those views is now accepted into the Labour Party. It's utterly bizarre. No, I certainly do not think we should be drowning people. Of course, if we could return them to France, we should be doing so, but the French won't have them. Uh, Aaron, I feel like the, the the host was kind of missing the point there. He's like, do you want to nudge? It's like, no, he's telling you this anecdote about how Labour's new MP wants to nudge them so they might drown. Uh, it was a very strange interview, but also quite phenomenal that this is sort of, Natalie Alfick was introducing Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer in his speech was talking a lot about how sort of Labour are going to be growing up and collaborate with the French and collaborate with the Europeans and they've just let this MP who literally wants our gunboats to shoot their gunboats. There were two things that really made me laugh actually with that interview, Michael. Like you say, firstly, there's the political content of, of what we've heard about Natalie Elphick, who, who seems to want a war with France. Uh, you know, very. I know the Conservatives like to hark back to the past, but that really was a long time ago. Uh, the Napoleonic Wars, I think, was the last time we weren't on the same side. Anyway, um, there was that. And then, of course, you've got the, the spectre of a Tory MP, Michael Fabrican. He's itching. He's itching to give great goss to this Sky presenter we've never seen before. He's itching to give him great goss, and he gives him a great vignette. And, and, and this little lemming, this little robo-presenter, can't even, can't even think for a moment. Think, well, hold on. He's giving me really intriguing original news in regards to a parliamentarian who's in the news cycle right now, Natalie Elphick. It can embarrass Labour. Oh, well, tell me more, please, Mr. Fabricant. No, he's, he's saying, well, do you think they should be nudged? Do I get to condemn this guy? Do I get to cancel this guy? No, you stupid muppet. He's literally giving you the thing you're meant to be doing at work. News. This is new information. Uh, so, yeah, look, it, it says something about the kinds of people that Labour are accepting into the parliamentary party, like Natalie Elphick, how ridiculous that is. But I actually think in a strange way, the, the more intriguing, interesting part of that clip is how, you know, we have a news presenter here who fundamentally isn't interested in news. He had a series of talking points in mind that they were just going to go through. Um, it's almost like a you know tick box, and then we'll move on to the next story. And, and this is why most people find political journalism so incredibly dull, boring, and low information, because it's not meant to be informative, right? It's just, I know what A is going to say. Okay, A, please say the thing I'm expecting you to say. I know what B is going to say. Okay, B, please say that thing. We all know what we already knew. Thank you and good night. That's, that's, not, that's not anything that people are going to care about, be passionate about, or want to watch, or want to listen to. So look, I mean, and this goes back, by the way, to the point of GB News, something that's really underpriced, I think, with, with, with conversations around GB News is that people, some people, and that's why it's beating Sky, some people find it entertaining, right? Now, you could say, well, Sky is far more informative. Well, clearly not. Ma Michael Fabrigan is trying to give this guy a great story and he won't, he won't take it. Uh, I think it tells you something actually quite quite concerning about the state of broadcast media in this country. Journalists, particularly political journalists, are some of the least curious people I have ever met in my life. This clip has divided the internet. It's the founder of the dating app Bumble talking about how artificial intelligence could revolutionize dating apps. Our focus with AI is to help create more healthy and equitable relationships. And that also starts with yourself. How can we actually teach you how to date? Mm -hmm. How can we help you show up in a better way? How so give me an example. Okay, so for example, you could in the near future be talking to your AI dating concierge mm -hmm. and you could share your insecurities. I just came out of a breakup. I have commitment issues. And it could help you train yourself into a better way of thinking about yourself. And then it could give you productive tips for communicating with other people. If you want to get really out there, there is a world where your dating concierge could go and date for you with other dating concierge. Uh, uh, no, no, truly. And then you don't have to talk to 600 people. It will just scan all of San Francisco for you and say, these are the three people you really ought to meet. Now, I said that clip divided the internet, but that was maybe somewhat misleading, as pretty much everyone seems to hate the idea expressed there. So tweets like this were pretty common. Thankfully, AI makes movies, writes books, creates art, and falls in love, so you can focus on the important things, taking the bins out and sending emails. 
Uh, and this is one of my favorites. At this point, being happily married must feel like having had the morning off from your job at the Twin Towers on 9-11. Um, lots of people also compared the clip to an episode of Black Mirror, which unfortunately I haven't yet seen. I might try and seek it out on the weekend. Um, comparisons were also made to arranged marriages. I like this one. Where I come from, we call them parents. Um, so this is the AI dating concierge, which is matching people up. Um, I say, though, it divided the internet because I also use the internet and another contrarian opinion for this evening. I think it's quite a good idea. And the reason I think it's quite a good idea, I said this on, on Twitter today, a few people got a little bit annoyed, is because I think this is a worrying idea if you're comparing it to the world before dating apps. You know, I, I think it's probably nicer to have a culture whereby you don't meet people on apps, you meet them in bars, you know, you meet friends of friends, you meet them in the workplace. I think that's probably nicer right? But actually what we live in, the, the world we live in at the moment is a world of terrible dating apps. And I don't think they're just terrible because of, you know, I mean, I mean, it is partly because they want you to get addicted to them. But I think the act of having so many profiles available to you, so sort of being able to swipe through a hundred profiles at a time, gives, it, it, our brains aren't very good at dealing with that. And I think it constantly gives people this sort of incentive where they say, well, that person seems all right, but that, that person seems a bit more, you know, attractive to me, either physically or in terms of the way they've described themselves. And everyone's constantly sort of trying to trade up to use sort of an unpleasant term. And that means that everyone's constantly sort of looking for something a little bit more and everyone ends up incredibly lonely. So I think given that everyone is using dating apps, the idea that you could have some AI to sort of sort this out and suggest you only free people and you know, you've only got those three, you're going to go on a date with one of them. That to me seems a lot more like pre, pre, pre sort of dating app world, because what, what change with dating apps is you can see a hundred people at the same time. If the, if the AI does this, this is a bit like your friend introducing you to someone you might get on with. Um, Aaron, what do you think? I know you probably haven't used a dating app in a while as a married man, but, uh, did you, did you use them before you got married? No. No, I've been, I mean, I mean, I've been with my wife for 10 years. <clears throat> Before her, I was with somebody who was moderately serious, um, didn't work out. Uh, and so not, no, not really. I mean, these things took off like, what, like 10 years ago, right? Um, no, I, I find the whole thing very, very strange, Michael. And I think, frankly, they have a deeply destructive impact on society. So hearing your argument there articulated with typical fluency, um, I understand your point of view, and I think there's something to it. But I actually think these things are a huge net negative for society. I think there's something really, really bad happening to, to, to people who've only ever understood dating within this context. The point is, you, you need to date people you don't get on with. You need to date bad matches. You need to go out with people who are bad matches, because then you learn about what a good match is. You work out who you are, what you like. You might surprise yourself. Sometimes what's a bad match might actually be a great match. Opposites can sometimes attract. Um, so this idea that we, we, we give away a slice of our freedom so we have an optimized search for the ideal partner, I find it very sad. And it, it goes to the argument that's made by Yanis Varoufakis of techno-feudalism, that actually the idea of the free sovereign individual is slowly being disintegrated by predictive algorithms, machine learning, um, and, and the fact that really we are merely a data point for a, a different kind of intelligence to aggregate all of that data and then sell the various options and preferences back to us. Uh, I, I, I am actually quite, I am quite concerned about it. The point about, by the way, um, arranged marriage is, is true. If you look at, for instance, in Iran, the, the sort of the family circles that I know, my, my dad's family is Iranian, there wouldn't be arranged marriage. People wouldn't be told who to marry. But what would happen is there would be introductions made. <clears throat> You're from a certain social demographic. You have these interests. Um, we think this is your personality type this person would be a good match. And often, obviously, people try and get a match where it's high social status, well off, et cetera, quote unquote, good family. What's the difference? What's the difference? Same religion. What's the difference? Right? It's a very strange one for me. So, no, I think it's quite a dangerous thing. And I think, I think actually there's, there's a great deal to be learned from failed relationships. The most important lessons in life will come from failed relationships, especially romantic ones. There was an interesting um, canyard I, I heard the other day, Michael. Um, this was from a, a veteran of the Vietnam War. 
And he said that one of the reasons why vets from the Vietnam War were, were so much more screwed up in his in his thinking, I mean, maybe this isn't objectively correct, but this was his interpretation, why they were so much more screwed up than veterans from World War II, despite both seeing horrific things, is that veterans from World War II returned to America from continental Europe on boats. Uh, they had, at length, conversations about what had happened over several weeks. They were collectively processing the trauma they'd been through effectively um, in a very human, fundamentally natural way. And then he said, well, what we had with Vietnam instead is that people basically went back home, uh, often not even talking to other people within their units, and they were just incredibly atomized. And, and I feel like, you know, lots of the, 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 the technology and the processes and the strategies that were being sold to solve problems in the 21st century, well, actually, this was the norm 100, 150 years ago. If you want to outsource your romantic interests and even your future partner to other people to quote unquote optimize uh, for a good choice, I don't see why Bumble and the CEO and their algorithm is any more reliable than your parents and your friends. I mean, I, 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 I'm really at a loss for it, actually. I think it really speaks to significant problems we have in the West. And I, I do think, by the way, this stuff will precipitate a return to quite reactionary forms of politics. People will say, well, hold on, I prefer arranged marriage. I, I think that. I don't, I don't say that with any happiness, by the way. I think there's a I, I did this tweet, actually, one of the responses to that, that video earlier on, which you didn't bring up, is that I think one of the great things of Western culture um, is that we see parents telling their children who they can and can't marry or go out with. We see that as a profound infringement on the autonomy of the individual. Many cultures don't, right? And, and I think it's sad, actually, that we, we have moved from a place where we understand the individual is autonomous and self-determining with regards to their romantic life, and we're saying, actually, no, there's a Silicon Valley company with a little algorithm. We'll give a little bit of autonomy over to them. I think that's a, that's a bad thing. Although your point about this being qualitatively better than the free-for-all we've seen with various dating apps over the last 10 years, there's probably some truth to that too. Well, I, I suppose I think you're, I mean, I think in part our difference probably comes from, I have I mean, I don't at the moment, I'm very happy with my partner, but you know, I, I spent most of the last 10 years on dating apps, I suppose. And, and I think that the, the current state of them is much more alienating. I think basically this AI model would be a lot more like the human model that preceded dating apps. And I think there is a distinction you're not quite making, Aaron, between an arranged marriage where, you know, the two individuals don't have a choice as whether to marry and then parents or friends or anyone suggesting dates, right? Because all this app would ever do is suggest you some dates. It's not take, I don't see how it's taking away the sovereignty of the individual because all the individuals still have the ultimate choice whether to go on the date or whether to, you know, hook up with the person, stay with the person. I, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't really get the argument actually when it comes to sort of the sovereignty of the individual. Now, range marriage, that you're going to marry this person. By the way, that's not how most of the world operates with these things. I gave the example of Iran, how that, you know, how that functions, people being introduced to a range of people who they think might be ideal fits. It's the exact same thing, Michael. It is the exact same thing. You're outsourcing a certain aspect of your choice to other people. And like you said, the final decision is with X or Y, but you're being pushed in, into certain directions. So, Michael, what, by the way, you're saying you use dating apps for the last 10 years. You're a good looking man, Michael. We always have such positive comments about you, your lovely jawline, your facial hair. Uh, we always have such lovely comments about you. Michael, just ask somebody for their number. Whatever happened to that? Or is that not a thing now? You know, old Aaron, man I have a lot of people's, do I not, do I I have a lot of people's numbers, you know? So not, necessarily people, not necessarily people in the comments, but th th my point is not that it's hard to get a date. On, on dating apps right now, it's very well, easy not. to get a date. Well, it depends, yeah. It will, it will depend on the person, right? But from my experience, the getting the date isn't the problem. It's the, the being a bit overwhelmed by choice and the people you are talking to are also overwhelmed by choice. So you've got a lot of very flaky interactions which, you know, I'm being flaky, other people are being flaky, and then you ultimately end up with sort of quite this frustrating and alienating experience of everyone being a bit like, oh, he seems kind of cool, but oh, that guy's kind of cool. Oh, he seems, I'm a bit busy. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, I think it overwhelms our, our, our brains. Well, don't do and it. I've, what? Don't do it. I've never watched a Harry Potter film, you know? So like, don't, yeah, don't I, use dating apps. But the, but the point is, if everyone is using a dating app, then I suppose if you're talking about the gay world, which is the, the world I move in, many, many gay pubs have closed down 
because people now use dating apps. So sort of the, the thing that used to keep many gay pubs alive, or say gay saunas, for example, would be that people who wanted to hook up would go there to meet people. Now, because people can meet each other by going on an app on their sofa, you don't have to spend any money. You can kind of do it just when you're bored, right? That has undermined many of those sort of organic places where that used to happen. So that's why I'm positive about this AI experience, this, this AI experience, because I think the damage has already been done by apps as they currently exist. And all this would be doing is making the world we live in um, more or less alienating, actually. But then we already have things like matchmaker.com. Like we, we've already had those. Yeah, but they weren't ubiquitous. The, 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 the issue is if everyone dates via those apps, it's like parents with smartphones, right? People say, why don't you just not give your kid a smartphone? Well, if everyone at your kid's school has a smartphone, then you've got to give your kid a smartphone. There are costs, you know, in the same way that there are network effects, so sort of it becomes more valuable to join a network that, that people are a part of. There are costs, or you, you, could, you could say them sort of network costs. There, there are, the number of people in a network mean it's more valuable to join it, and it also means it's more costly not to. So it is hard to go it alone because lots of those organic sort of methods of meeting people have been eroded. Let's look at another video um, that's annoyed people this week. It's Apple's advert for their newest iPad. Um, as you can imagine, this, this originally came with music, um, but that will get us copyrighted on YouTube. You can see a record playing there. You've got all sorts of artistic equipment, um, which is being crushed by a hydraulic press, I believe it's called. Um, so you've got these sort of two really big, I don't know, is it cast iron, stainless steel, crushing this paint, crushing this piano. Everything's just getting completely obliterated. Very impressive um, looking video. The sculptures are being mushed. You get to the end there, it's all squished. And out there, you get the thinnest iPad ever. Um, obviously, the intention behind this ad was to say, in this tiny little piece of equipment, we have managed to concentrate all of the creative abilities and capacities that one might have had by using all of this equipment, which we, we just crushed. I can see where they were coming from, but people are annoyed. The advert has been viewed 56 million times on Twitter, mainly because of people sharing it in fury. Um, these were some of the top replies. You destroyed all the creative tools and efforts of humans. Worst commercial ever. I'm not sure wanton destruction of all the good and beautiful things is this world, or in this world was really the vibe you were trying for. The symbolism of indiscriminately crushing beautiful creative tools is an interesting choice. I can't relate to this video at all. It lacks any respect for creative equipment and mocks the creators. And you can see these have all got hundreds of thousands of likes or hundreds of thousands of views, tens of thousands of likes. Um, and Apple haven't just decided this is just Twitter. Um, they've taken the criticism to heart. Their VP of Marketing Communications released this statement on Thursday. Our goal is to always celebrate the myriad of ways users express themselves and bring their ideas to life through iPad. We missed the mark with this video and we're sorry. I love that. The, the corporate apology where they say, we missed the mark with this one. Um, Aaron, were they right to apologize? Were people right to be furious? Well, they're right to apologize. Well, I suppose they think they're right to apologize because they've done it and it was a big PR disaster. There's a great quote from uh, Meredith Whitaker, my, my favorite tweet. She says here, it's notable that even Apple, a paragon of brand creation and maintenance, is so out of touch with this moment. It's not 2015. People want human art and no one trusts big tech. I think that's just so superbly put. You know, we just had um, June 2 come out recently. Uh, and of course, the, the, the the premise of the Dune films, so that's not very clear in the films, but the premise of the, of the Dune universe is that all of this is happening after something thousands of years earlier called the Butlerian Jihad. There's an uprising against thinking machines. Precisely in order to make humans free, they destroy these, these machines to, to, to re-dignify the human essence, to re-enchant the world, as Max Weber might say. And, and I, think that's, I think that's a very valid critique, by the way, of technology. Uh, that's not to say I think we should destroy all technologies. I think there's many upsides to even an iPad. Uh, but there clearly are downsides too. And it was almost as if Apple was luxuriating in those downsides in the commercial. Um, so, you know, the tactility of a, of a musical instrument or, or, or the real world conversation you have with a friend in a bar is so profoundly different to a Zoom conversation. And I think this was really driven home to people by the pandemic, right? 
you know, it's great. The virtual world is great. People are watching this or listening to this because of the virtual world. I spend loads of time in the virtual world. Uh, I love podcasts. They're brilliant. Long form conversations are in no way inferior to what we were seeing on television 20 years ago. In fact, they're far better. Uh, but, but, but it's clear that, you know, things can go too far and that, you know, you can spend too much time in the digital world. You mentioned a moment ago, Michael, about gay dating apps destroying offline spaces for LGBT people. I think that's a, I think that's a tragedy. I think it's a profound tragedy for the social fabric of, of somewhere like London and, of course, many other places too. So the thing for me, as Meredith Whittaker said in her tweet, is how Apple don't realize that moment's gone, right? Apple don't realize that there is now a profound, deep-seated cynicism about big tech, also a pessimism about the role of technology going forward. You know, 20 years ago, as you get Facebook and Apple and uh, Google coming onto the scene, there was actually, amongst many people, myself included, the presumption that these tools were going to make life better. There will be some downsides, but they'll make life better. Now we're hearing siren voices like Jonathan Haidt. Um, you don't have to agree with everything he said or even everything in his new book, but there are siren voices out there who say, actually, for instance, young people having, having access to smartphones, possibly unwise. We spoke a moment ago about dating apps. That doesn't mean you're a Luddite and you get rid of it all, but there is a skepticism, sometimes a cynicism, sometimes a pessimism. And Apple, like I say, just well, like a bull in a china shop. It's like none of that conversation was happening. You know, it's still 2006. We've still just released the latest iPod. And actually, just to conclude, for me, it showed a real incongruence the first time, for the first time, I think, in decades, where Apple aren't in touch with the mainstream culture about what optimism looks like, about what the future looks like about what modernity looks like or what we want it to look like. And I think that's really interesting. Amid the wave of student protests demanding an end to a genocidal war, finally, a politician with pedigree in the Middle East has decided to speak truth to power. I have had many conversations, as you have had, uh, with a lot of young people over uh, the last many months now. And you're right, they don't know uh, very much at all about the history of the Middle East, or frankly about history um, in many areas uh, of the world, including in our own country. But with respect to the Middle East, uh, they don't know that um, under the, uh, uh, the bringing together of uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians um, by my husband, uh, the then Israeli uh, Prime Minister Ehud Barak, the then head of the Palestinian uh, Liberation uh, Organization, then the Palestinian Authority, Yasser Arafat. Um, an offer was made uh, to uh, the Palestinians for a state um, on, you know, 96% of the existing uh, territory occupied by the Palestinians with 4% of Israel to be given to reach 100% of the amount of territory that um, was uh, hoped for. And this offer was made, and if uh, Yasser Arafat had accepted it, there would have been a Palestinian state now for about 24 years. That was Hillary Clinton, backer of the disastrous Iraq war and destroyer of Libya, accusing students of not knowing their history when it comes to the Middle East. Um, Aaron, what is your response to the former Secretary of State? Don't they know they were offered a Palestinian state almost three decades ago, which wouldn't have had sufficient water for the people living in that territory to live? Don't they know there was this generous kind offer? And by the way, the Israeli politician involved in that was killed by an Israeli extremist. Tells you something about... Uh, Israeli politics. And actually, that was a, a taste of what was to come in the decades that have followed. By the way, Michael, this is meant to be one of the leading political figures in American public life in recent decades. And she's saying an um and an ah every second word. <laughs> it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty extraordinary, right? Uh, people talk about George W. Bush and Donald Trump. Oh, wow, well, their rhetoric isn't very good. They, they sound like fifth grade students or whatever. I mean, she can't complete a sentence without umming and ahhing. Um, look, I said it there. Um, I think my ratio is a little bit better than Hillary Clinton, though. On the point here about dismissing young people, you've just seen there, um, in the briefest possible time, why Hillary Clinton lost the 2016 election. She has this extraordinary mix of hubris and arrogance with a complete inability to be in touch with the people whose votes she needs, and also uh, a complete inability to, to think like people who don't think like her. Uh, 
And that, to me, isn't the entire Democratic Party establishment. They're not all that stupid. But I think for a long time, people, myself included, thought, well, this is just the American establishment, the American center. They're insane. They're not worth listening to. I think the experience of Trump and also Bernie Sanders has actually sharpened a lot of people up. They're not so dumb anymore. But we had a little bit of a blast from the past there, Michael, because Hillary Rodham Clinton is still very much in the same place as uh, eight years ago. We do have an update for you on Palestine. The UN General Assembly has overwhelmingly passed um, the resolution for the UN Security Council to reconsider and support full UN membership for Palestine. Um, among other countries, the US voted against and the UK abstained. So you've still got the United States taking a very extreme position. So I, I think there was only eight countries that voted against the United States one of them. Um, so the overwhelming majority of UN members want Palestine to become a full UN member. Um, and it's being blocked by this small minority, this this axis of evil. I'm not going to call them the axis of evil, but this, this, this group of rogue nations uh, who are trying to protect sort of, at the moment, what looks like one of the most rogue nations, Israel. The socialist author Grace Blakely and Labour's Lisa Nandy were both on Question Time this week, and it got pretty tense to kick off the row in a conversation about Natalie Elphick joining the Labour Party, Grace brought up broader issues about trust in politics. I think it speaks to the, the point that um, the, um, the lady made about can we really trust politicians? I think this actually sits at the core of our democracy right now. Trust in political parties is at all-time lows because people see politicians making promises and then going into Westminster and saying, oh, it's actually too difficult, there's no money left, we can't do any of the things that we promised you. Um, and it's, I think, a really cynical move on the part of our politicians just to say, you know, that we couldn't possibly fulfil these promises that we've been making to people. Even more cynical not to even make the promises in the first place, as I think Keir Starmer is failing to do, because you basically say either there's not enough money left to fix the NHS or I'm going to encounter too much opposition, I can't possibly do anything. We have gone through in this parliament, this has been the first parliament in modern history where living standards have fallen. And that comes on the back of the longest period of wage stagnation since the 1800s. People are desperate for change. And if politicians don't deliver that, I'm worried about the future for our democracy. She got a big round of applause for that. Um, so that really went down well in the room. Lisa Nandy, though, wasn't impressed. This is how she responded. And I'm afraid I won't take any lectures from Grace, who was a champion for a manifesto that was fundamentally dishonest at the last election. We had one party going into it saying we can do everything. We can spend all the money in the world and we can deliver absolutely everything, knowing full well that they couldn't. And we in had another that, that political dishonest, party. Lisa. Sorry, Grace, you had, a, you had a long say. And actually what that did to many working people across this country was rob them of any hope that things could possibly get better. Because against that, you had Boris Johnson and these big promises of levelling up that have come to absolutely nothing. So when we say we are going to implement the New Deal for working people, when we say we are going to get Britain building, you can absolutely rest assured that we mean it and that we're going to deliver it. But Lisa, your kind of visceral hatred of everything that happened during the Corbyn era, and I think this is true of, of lots of people in the Labour leadership, means that you've looked at that manifesto, seen there was a lot in it, that is true, and just said anything that Corbynism has touched, we can't go near, which means that you have a, a manifesto that's basically empty. That's just rubbish. It's got effectively I mean, nothing I'll, I'll in give it. You, I'll give you one example of that. Just last week, we announced that we're going to take our rail franchises back into national ownership as the contracts expire. We're not going to promise to buy them out because we don't think we should be using people's money to bail out shareholders. It's their money and they haven't got a lot of it. But what we are going to do is put our railways back in public hands for the public good. So I'm afraid that's just not true. Aaron, I want your view on this one. What did you make of that row? Lisa Nanny just comes across as so, um, so dislikable. And also, this weird thing right now, Mike, where particularly Labour politicians, centrist Labour politicians, they think that their job is to be pundits, not politicians. So you have a Labour politician who stood on the Labour Party manifesto in 2019. That is technically why people vote for the, for the, the candidate, the party, because of the manifesto. That's why, that's the basis, the platform on which Lisa Nandy was voted in as Wigan MP. You have the person who stood on that manifesto, knocked on doors to sell that manifesto, is condemning a journalist. I'll take no lessons from you. It's just so dislikable. And by the way, the reason why they behave like this, I've seen it firsthand, is they are not used to people to their left being in the same room as them. I've done BBC with Portillo and with Andrew Neil, and then I've had Liz Kendall. And I can absolutely tell you with absolute cast iron certainty, 
Miss Kendall hated me far more than the other two because she has not been in a studio many times where she's not the most left-wing person. And this, I think, was a really big moment of realization for me is that for them, this isn't a political disagreement, Michael. It's an attack on their persona, their, their individual essence. But I'm the most virtuous left-wing person here. Does somebody else doing that? They must be evil. They must be awful. I must condemn them. Uh, so you can see that in, in Lisa and Andy's eyes. I mean, it looks actually, quite frankly, very strange. Uh, and when she said that, she got no applause. It went down like a, a lead balloon. And then she, she tweeted a clip of it afterwards. But anyway, um, so the condemnation I find very strange. And on the other hand, she's then saying, it was an awful manifesto. I won't take any lessons from you, but we're keeping this thing from that manifesto in regards to public ownership of rail, which, by the way, wasn't in the 2015 Labour manifesto. So she's tacitly admitting that there are aspects of the Corbyn agenda which have inflected the Labour Party. And she says, well, we won't waste money buying those franchises. We'll wait for them to elapse. That was the position Labour had in 2019. They were going to wait for the franchises to elapse. That's not new. What we see in that clip is just so much um, about contemporary sort of leading lights in the Labour Party and why you really probably shouldn't like them. Mendacity, lack of detail, um, just venom and anger for no particular reason. And look, I'm intrigued to see how that kind of personality politics plays when they're actually in power. They love to condemn other people. That's been the sort of MO for the Labour right and the, the Labour centre for a very long time. I am genuinely interested to see how they will condemn people when they themselves are the ones in charge. It's certainly going to be fascinating to watch. I'm sure Lisa and Andy would disagree with that analysis. That's me being very balanced. We haven't got time for much more. Uh, so that's all you're going to get. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's been a very interesting one. It was a great show. We probably talked for a little bit too long about dating apps, Michael. My apologies. I enjoyed that conversation. I don't think you need to apologize for that. Um, also, I participated in it. Maybe that was actually a barbed criticism of me. I'm the host. I'm supposed to keep time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching this evening. Uh, have a wonderful weekend. I hope you get to enjoy it. The sun will be back on Monday, as ever. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.